are you doing this morning? Woohoo! Are you excited for the first in person process Palooza in like three years? Woohoo! Okay. I am so happy to be here. I'm Tracy O'Rourke. I am the Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt Instructor for the Division of Extended Studies. I am also on the committee for the Process Palooza team, and I am one of your MCs for this event, and I am happy to be here. Okay, we have a really exciting lineup for you. You guys are great. It's great that you're here because we're also live streaming in the ballrooms as well. But you guys get to experience firsthand in this theater the Asayake Taiko drummers. Woohoo! And take it away.
to continue with the inspiration. This person needs no introduction, really. So I would like to welcome to the stage UC San Diego's Chancellor, Pradeen Kosla. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everybody. Actually, you should have welcomed me while they were still playing. So I could walk here with a drum roll. Anyway, good morning, everybody, and it was so good to see so many of you so early in the morning. And uh, I know that we've been trying to slowly come back uh, to work in person, uh, and I was not expecting a crowd this big, but this is really impressive. Uh, I think people are sick and tired of staying at home. So I, I know I am. So this is really good. And uh, Process Palooza, this is like the fifth, fifth one in a row uh, after about three years of COVID. Uh, so the first time after three years of COVID, and this is an important part of who we are. But before I tell you why it's important, let's just give our students one more big hand. Asayaki Taiko. There. Long time ago, when I was in Japan visiting once for a conference, uh, I was, they made me do one of these things for like 30 seconds, I'm telling you. It's not easy. You realize how much out of tune you are and how you don't have a sense of tune and rhythm at all, right? This is not that easy at all. It's very difficult. So amazing students, are very talented students. Anyway, so Process Palooza, this is an important part of who we are because this is about all about bringing a Lean Six Sigma way of thinking. Uh, something that happened back in the 80s that disrupted our car industry in a big way. Uh, but on the other hand, it also taught us a very good lesson as to how we need to be agile and nimble to create a sustainable infrastructure, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's a university process or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you need to be, you need to be both agile and nimble in these changing times. So this is an important part of uh, making us all agile and nimble. And it started off, uh, at UC San Diego, we are always a misfit in the UC system to some extent, not completely, but to some extent. We have some many bad habits of UC system, but we also have really good habits that are not in the UC system. And Agile Six and this Six Lean Six Sigma is one of them, where I think this campus has the most uh, number of trained people, uh, yellow and green belts in this area. And this was done on purpose when we were finishing a strategic plan. The whole idea, the fifth pillar of the strategic plan, if you go back and read it, is basically creating an agile, sustainable infrastructure for our processes uh, so that we can always be in this mode of continuous process improvement. And this has been embraced so much uh, that I'm both surprised and pleased because of the tons of people in all the times so over 200 departments thousands of people who have been trained in this. And I can see this in our day-to-day -day operations. They are still not perfect, but I'm telling you they're getting better and better every day because each and every one of you who's trained in this really brings it home to your department, starts practicing it, uh, understanding how to collaborate better, how to work with each other, how to support each other, how to create improvements, how to be more efficient. I can just go down the list. And were it not for all of this, in these last decade of difficult budget times, we are the only campus that has not, like 
cut our budgets uh, very aggressively just once right before COVID, only for safety's sake, only to create a safety margin, but not because of necessity. And we are the only campus as we speak right now, there are multiple campuses cutting their budgets, but I think because we have this notion of efficiency improvement, we are able to always find resources to always cut that little corner, make it more efficient, and make sure that we're investing back into the infrastructure of this great enterprise. So thank you all for being part of this. Uh, the theme is like build, unbuild, rebuild. And what we could not have a more nerdy theme for this engineer than <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's what we engineers do for a living. So we love this, right? So, so, but I think it is also the right way to think about this. Just because something is built doesn't mean it cannot be undone, and does not mean it cannot be redone. And we should be in whole process of self improvement is to really creating habits in yourself, un unbuilding or uncreating those habits, and then recreating other new habits, right? So this applies to human beings, this applies to uh, artifacts, this applies to IT systems, this applies to every everything. And it would not happen were it not for each and every one of you really committed to this. It's hard work. Uh, it takes commitment. It's part of your job, but it's also in addition to your job in some sense. So I really appreciate everything you do uh, to make not only each and every one of you more efficient and better, to make your departments better, but most of all, to make this campus a spectacular campus. Uh, really, uh, I think in the UC system, it's reasonable to say, even amongst the regions, it's recognized to be uh, the leading light uh, for the UC system where other campuses should be going. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your partnership, your support. And I look forward to helping you in any which way I can, including staying out of your way, uh, if that's what you want. And welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Kosla, with your support. We are very successful, and I know there's a lot of organizations that are very envious for having such high-level support at the organization, so thank you so much. Okay, we are going to now move to Associate Vice Chancellor Marie Cardi dubois Well, thank you so much, Tracy, for the introduction. So um, I am Marie Calder Dubois. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Resource Administration. And I can tell you there's no better event I would like to be associated with than this one. I think today, um, for you here in the room and others, you really are the embodiment of engagement, innovation, a change of spirit. And as uh, our chancellor mentioned, this transformation, the campus started the transformation with Lean Six Sigma. And Lean Six Sigma, the way I see it is uh, powerful tools. Uh, I refer it more as a toolbox when we can pick up processes and we can pick each other's brain. Uh, and that give us a common language and allow us to share practices and regardless to our role. However, for me, uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege to live in Japan. For me, it's more than this. It's really a culture. It's really a way of seeing life. It's really a personal way of thinking about everything. So I come from France originally, so way further away from the Lean's kind of culture. And it has been a huge culture shock for me when I saw in Japan that people were parking one car at a time, spot one, first car, spot two, second car, when in my country, it's everywhere. But a very quick, quickly, I realized that there were a reason behind it is that people were able to exit the mall way more efficiently than we were able to in my native country. So for me, that really teach me uh, to, think very differently about everything I do in every day. So to date, I would like to also give you a little bit of numbers. We have trained on this campus more than 7,000 indiv individual in Lean Six Sigma. And we continue. We have given white, uh, yellow, green, and black belts. And the impact of this training has been immediate and very profound. Today, we estimate the saving of around $50 million on this campus with just little thing done. So it's quite remarkable. 
In Academic Affair, where I'm responsible, we've also created a center of excellence two years ago. And it is a place when we can ask ourselves why we're doing things and should we continue to do things? And uh, is there a better way to do things? And I think we are creating this, this uh, spirit of collaboration. But today I would like us to think about the obstacle to innovation, what comes between us and our ability to uh, do exactly build, uh, unbuild and rebuild. So those themes are going to be very familiar to you, I'm sure. The resistance to change and the fear of failure, this is a big deal, how we can overcome this feeling. Um, our risk aversion, we are often, uh, um, dealing with a lot of compliance issues and what is the right balance? Which kind of risk can we take? We as academic units, often we are thinking in siloed and we are thinking greatly, but maybe putting our brain together, we can do even things bigger. And that's why the uh, EVC has created the collective impact project. And my favorite uh, is the lack of resource. We hear very often we don't have enough today. So I would like to, to say one word about the lack of resource. Today, the theme um, that we have to ask ourselves is build and build and rebuild. And in my many years in uh, higher education and in medicine, I can tell you without a doubt that the most difficult task is the word in between, is the un it's the unbuild. We are pretty good in adding up. We are, I'm sure you have all witnessed uh, more task force and more work group. And we're gonna add a structure because we didn't think about this or we didn't include this person. But how do we do to unbuild what we have thought that was the solution at the time? And I think this is the real challenge today. So today I, uh, I engage you and I invite you to think big, to think about how you can transform the culture, how you can transform the campus, our community, and to have very disruptive talks because changes can only come with disruptions. So thank you so much and enjoy your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Associate Vice Chancellor Marie Carter Dubois. Thank you for sharing the results. Thank you for talking about how many people we've trained. That is a great journey, isn't it? And I agree with you. I think the unbuilding is really hard. We talk about in Greenbelt, our Greenbelt class sometimes, when we try to unbuild a process, somebody built it. And now you have to tell them, well, it's not working so great, right? And suddenly they, they feel like you're calling me a baby ugly, right? And that's not fun. And so we have to be careful how we, how we involve people. We don't want to make people feel bad. They need to be a part of the next step in the journey. So we have to be careful. We can't just say your baby's ugly, right? We have to do a better job than that. Um, thank you so much. Okay, we are going to hear now from our platinum sponsor, Cisco, Ralph Simmons. Wow, I thought I was productive. I get up at most mornings at four o'clock and um, it's not often I get to fit in a whole concert by 8.30. Um, it's amazing. But so thank you so much, UC San Diego. My name is Rolf Simmons. I'm the regional manager here in, in um, California for the UC system. And you know, we really are honored and grateful to be here today. Um, I think, I think it, 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 it's hard to put into just plain words about how we value the partnership that we have here at the UCSD. So I want to thank you, Vince, and certainly Pradeep has, has exited, but to thank you guys so much. You know, so great to meet you guys this morning. Um, I want to I want to just have share a few thoughts here with you regarding um, not only Cisco, but you know, just kind of how we're seeing the you know the world and how we're developing things. Um, you know, Cisco's mission is powering an inclusive future for all. And yeah, it's intentionally aspirational, like most missions, uh, mission statements. Um, however, you know, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of what it means to us. You know, certainly, you know, at a, at a basic level, certainly within higher ed, um, for us, it means coming out of the pandemic for sure. You know, we want to make sure that you know we are the ones driving hybrid work, right? Powering hybrid work. And what does that mean, really? You know, meaning you get to choose your device connect to the network that you're allowed to connect to securely, 
right? And work in the environment that you're most comfortable, where you feel most productive. Marie just asked me, you know, do I go into the office very often? I'm proud to work for a company that said, uh, you know, no, I don't go in very often. Because from our, our CEO right down, his philosophy around that is he wants the office or wherever you're meeting to be a magnet, not a mandate. Because it's where I'm most productive. It's where we can accomplish the most. So I, that, that's just one example. So certainly for the faculty here, for the students here, where are they most productive? We want to make sure that they have access with their devices to the network that they're authorized to be on. So the security is a part of it. Okay. As the second thought I have on that is last year, I'm not really sure if people here in the audience are aware, Cisco has a networking academy. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's fantastic. Young people, old people, everybody is involved in this networking academy across the globe. Last year, Cisco had its 25th anniversary of that networking academy. 25th anniversary, 25 years doing this. But what's so amazing, it blew my mind. I mean, I'm with the company one year, I didn't know this. Last year, we had trained over 17 and a half million people in that set. Exactly. Digital skills for the last 25 years, 17 and a half million people. M make it worse, they have set themselves a goal over the next 10 years, to train another 3.4 million people. So I know my energy is kind of hard at this time, but I'm up at four. So by now I have a lot more than everybody else, okay? So please forgive me. Um, so the, the, the last thing I wanna do is really just a, a shameless plug more than anything else. So we have a treat. Last year I met Vince, he probably does not remember when I met him. Um, but he challenged us at a time on that call or in that meeting that um, he wanted to see Cisco, you know, growing to a company that was doing a little bit more and helping, you know, UCSD, how to think about some of the challenges that we're going through today. Not just selling us solutions, because yeah, it's easy, right? Cisco has 80,000 employees, almost 100, was it 100, no, 98, 98 countries. And it's easy, right, to say, oh, they just sell a bunch of stuff, a bunch of hardware, a bunch of software. Oh, that's some cool stuff, great. But you know, I think the example he was talking about was cybersecurity and he described cybersecurity had, had kind of moved away from just buying an antivirus or a firewall and into war games. That was a term he used, war games, stuck with me. And, um, and I said, yeah, you're right. You know, and, he, and I think you know, my manager was on the phone at the time. She said, you know, Cisco is the sixth largest security company in the world based on revenues. And he's like, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. You need to help us how to think about security. And so why I say I have a treat coming up Today in, uh, is it the green table room? Is that what it's called? On the second floor? We have just an amazing presentation planned. Our supply chain team is talking, is gonna be dealing with what they went through, how they handled the challenges, um, the disruptions created by the pandemic. On top of that, this how we have pulled ourselves out of the semiconductor shortage globally. So I think, again, it's a great time um, to, to get this message. But again, last thing I want to do is thank my partners, E+, and thank you again, UC San Diego, for having us here today. We really do appreciate the invite to be a sponsor. Thanks again, guys. Thank you so much, Rolf. I just have to say that I just want my stuff to work. You know, you just want your, sh your phone to work, your laptop to work. You want to have internet when you need it. You don't want to have to think about it. So thank you for doing a great job and I don't have to think about you. You know, that's, that's like the best thing ever. So I'm hugging you secretly all different kinds of times. Okay, so thank you so much. Okay, we have um, our last presenter for this, this, uh, this morning and that is, please help me welcome to the stage, UC San Diego's Chief Financial Officer, Vince Kellen. Chief Information Officer, of course. This, hopefully this, this is on, can you hear me? There we go, good. No, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have a French accent, so I can't, I cannot do that. 
Uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks, Cisco, for stepping up in a big way to be a Platinum sponsor. Appreciate that a lot and all the support you've been giving us, as well as all of our sponsors here. Today, I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction on this, and I'm going to share a little bit of my background along the way, and hopefully I'll be able to advance the slides here. Let's see. What's the secret weapon here? There we go. Is this working, folks? Let's go. See. There we go. Uh, I'm going to share, a, you know, looking at Lean Six Sigma and thinking about improvement, I've noticed that for our organization and many organizations, we put on methodologies like a jacket. And then we take it off like a jacket. It doesn't always get completely internalized by practitioners, people doing the work. And that's kind of interesting because you'll see certain patterns, uh, and certainly we see it on, on IT projects, right? So I'm constantly chiding our project managers, you keep telling me all the things you need to solve the problem, you're not telling me how to solve the problem. Why are we doing that? Well, it's very easy to recall, oh, I need a project charter, oh, I need this, oh, I need that, and then, you know, a thousand hours later, you still haven't solved the problem. And we do that because it's easy, right? It's very hard to think of the most difficult problem. So it's very common for problem solvers to delay that, which I'm contending here today is the exact opposite. I think also there's a class of people, and maybe I was one of them at one time in my career, where we kind of go, use the methodology as sort of a uh, kind of a comfortable chair. I can get into it. I don't have to think very hard. I can just follow what the methodology is saying. And that's also uh, a bit of an issue. And it's also interesting that we have this aversion to thinking difficult thoughts naturally. Nature gives us this. All, all organisms have as a prime directive to conserve energy. And our brains can consume 20% of our caloric budget every day. So it is expensive. And so the question I ask, are we wearing, in fact, is Lean Six Sigma an elaborate methodology that we're using in order to avoid more difficult work? And that's why I have a picture of the hat. That's a famous saying, all hat, no cattle, or a 10-gallon hat, 100 head of cattle. That hat is way too big for the amount of cattle you're bringing in. And it's something to think about. So we'll talk more about that. Let's go to the next slide since this doesn't seem to be operating. Somebody have control of the slides? There we go. Uh, so I put up here is an idealized rendering of a personal improvement process. And quite frankly, it can apply to anything really. And it is really kind of a, 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 an abstraction from the Plan, Do, Check, Act, which obviously we should all be familiar with in Lean Six Sigma along with quality improvement. Um, also, for those in the military, the Observe, Orient, Decide Act, the famous OODA loops uh, that are out there, this is really con consistent with that. But you can break down the cycle of improvement into I imagining something that I wish to do. I'm reifying it, meaning I'm making it occur. I'm making it real. And then finally, I'm validating immediately after I did that, is that kind of what I intended? Well, that's the Plan, Do, Check, Act, roughly. But in, if you play this in your mind, it, it works just as well uh, along with it. So I'm going to now step into the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to dispense with this, let you guys advance the slide for me. I've been involved in the martial arts for about 30 years of my life. I was a Taekwondo instructor for 25 of those years uh, in Taekwondo. Uh, what's also interesting is all martial arts that we know of today kind of have their origins with India. So for any of those folks from India, you have a proud contribution to all the martial arts that we practice in the world today. Uh, no, back, back a slide. Back a slide. There we go. This process of improvement can apply to physical skills as well. So in the martial arts, we'll often have a session with a student where we're saying, okay, let's work on what you want to do with this sidekick, for example. And while the instructor will certainly have an image of what that, of that sidekick will look, what needs to look like, it's the students and the image that the student has in their head that's most important. And the good student is trying. They're imagining. They're executing the action. And then they're quickly saying, okay, is that on target? And by the way, we break boards in the martial arts to give us evidence that this process is working with fidelity. 
it's working as intended. And we actually joyfully <laughs> approach those boards. And occasionally that doesn't quite work and sometimes you break a few things, but that's another story. Uh, so this can work well with physical skills. And in fact, in the physical realm of research, there's been a lot of research into mental visualization for athletes and how that can work cognitively. Let's go to the next slide. The same thing can occur in our own intellectual work. In fact, I've been talking with, uh, uh, I don't know if we have Judy here uh, from our BI team and others from our BI team. Anybody from our BI teams here? I've been going back and forth with them at length about how can we do a better job of eliminating rework in our own minds? And so that rework has uh, also a, a thing to do as we produce something. So as I'm personally working out or you are personally working on a particular concept, you can apply this very same concept of imagine, reify and validate over and over and over to your own work. And so frequently as we pass things off to each other, as we construct what we do in our unit, uh, we often say, okay, maybe I could have done a little better job sending it along. Now this sets up an interesting tension between agile and communal work and agile and private work, which we'll talk about a little bit. Next slide. As we go through this cycle, there are three sort of concepts to take into mind. Uh, and the first one is progressive simulation or progressive ideation. Often we can think of ideas in our mind as we do whether it be a business process improvement, whether it be, an, uh, if, if you're an IT, an IT artifact you're creating. But that vision starts in the brain. What we don't tap into enough is how we can rehearse that image over and over and over and progressively add to it. Now, why am I talking about this? Early in my career, I was actually in accounting. Any accountants in the room or people in accounting? Yeah, I, I, I didn't really like it, so I didn't have the French accent, so I didn't do it. Um, but uh, I was also a computer hobbyist at the time. And the only time I had to actually do my hobby was either at home at night or in the car where I could simulate. So I would simulate over and over and over again to try to get as much done as I could uh, to sort of feed my hobby of computer programming. And so that's progressive ideation, constantly cycling around over and over and adding details to it. That's not enough though. We have to concretize our thoughts. We have to think of an exact example of it, visualize it in action. How would it look and feel if it were real? So even with our own minds, we want to concretize the thing. And then the last thing is continual validation. The next thing we want to do is we say, okay, where can it fail? What is not right about this idea? And when we do this in pairs, uh, and Kevin Chow's Kevin here? Kevin, you're not here. Oh, my goodness. Well, if Kevin were here, we, we, Kevin and I do this all the time. So we do, do this ideation, validation back and forth, and then progressive concretization along the way. And that's an important part of this. So you have to have what's in your mind continue to do that. By the way, this is a recapitulation of how in software development methods, how Agile works. There's an idea, it gets reified as a prototype, and it gets validated quickly, and then you complete the next cycle. So you take that approach and apply it to our own thoughts, and you get personal agility. Next slide. Now, this concretization abstraction process is important. Uh, there's a term here I like to use called metababble. Metababble are when people talk in industry, typically abstractions, with great fluidity nodding their heads like they're totally understanding and yet you're wondering do they really understand and oftentimes we are guilty of that in certain technical industries of a sort of meta babble on one hand the abstraction is very helpful in that it helps us communicate very quickly and compactly about complex ideas so it says oh we have a platform for that okay let's unpack the term platform what is that that's an abstraction not very concrete just yet and so the goal here is we want to take the abstraction, use it, but we also want to be able to concretize it. More importantly, for what we create, whether it be new processes, uh, new configurations in software or new software outright, the abstractions are scaffolding. It's like the stuff around the building that you need to build the building. 
but it can be dispensed with once the building is built. We don't have to live in the scaffolding. So we don't live there. Next slide. This concretization component is extremely important. And this is a very interesting uh, model for how to think about how knowledge flows in organizations. I won't go into all parts of the model. What I will say is there's this process between abstraction and concretization where you have to iterate over and over to take an abstraction, to take an idea that you have and now actually make it live and breathe either in your mind or with others and concretize it. And that process can go back and forth. You can start at the concrete and grow up to the abstraction. You can start at the abstraction and go down into the concrete both okay. It's a cycle. You want to uh, go back and forth. So one of the tests I do with my team when they speak in abstractions to me, I say, give me a specific example. Now give me another example. Now give me some failure mode analysis of that example. And that tells me whether there's been adequate simulation uh, in the mind or with the teams. What's also interesting about this, and certainly in the software world on the business side and the IT side, there's this fascination with logical design and what we call physical or actual implementation. And we often have two teams that go off with separate languages. In this model, they merge. In fact, the, the boundary between logical and physical becomes very murky. Uh, and in time, it all becomes concrete and physical anyway. Next slide. Now, if you want to do personal agility, you gotta figure out where to do it and exactly how. And to me, the answer is quite simple. The cheapest place to do this work is in between your ears because you can change your mind. You can say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try this way. And you don't have to get on the phone and call somebody. You don't have to change a diagram or a document. And Lord knows you don't have to, because you haven't built anything, you don't have to change what you've just built. Very often, uh, people earlier in their career in whatever it is, dive right into the building because the building is a way that helps them think. Unfortunately, they get indebted to what they just built and they now have this sort of sunk cost bias. Well, I've just built it, I can't undo it. This is the unbuild process. In personal agility, the unbuild is built right in from the get-go. It's a build and unbuild right away uh, as part of the process. So you wanna do it in your mind first, go back. Then you want to do it in a few minds. I put the word nifty collaboration here to say a few minds who can do this well, um, and but a few minds. And for us, it's two, maybe three folks. Uh, and it's just in time, point to point. It doesn't have to be a planned meeting. We use tools, collaboration tools to say, hey, you're, you, I see that you're available. Let's chat. Or we send a chat message. When will you be available? Let's talk. So lots of point to point. A pencil and paper. It's a powerful tool. Uh, when I see people power up Visio or some of these uh, visual diagramming tools and they immediately start doing work, I'm like, no, no, stop all that, stop all that. Explain to me the problem you're trying to solve and explain to me the concretization you're applying to it and do that in the most economical fashion that you can. Don't let the scaffolding of the tools get in the way. Now you can move to simple rendering tools, sure. And for us, believe it or not, it's things like, I call it Word, but it's more like Word as a notepad, not Word as a fancy font, you know, with fonts and all that, all that stuff around it. And then Excel spreadsheets, believe it or not, just simple lists of things. And so we like to iterate in those sorts of artifacts so that the artifacts are as light as they can possibly be. And we will move to the more elaborate tools absolutely at the right time. And then, of course, developing a runnable prototype. And there's always a class of the program was like, no, 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 no. And they just quit the prototype right away. And it actually looks kind of good. But then over time, you start to realize some of the assumptions that went into that prototype are incorrect. They're not resilient to change. They're very expensive to alter over time. It's because of the lack of uh, continual simulation. There's another problem in this approach is where to push what we call design oscillations. Design oscillations occur when you change your mind. So obviously it makes sense. You wanna push all the design oscillations you can into the single mind or the small team of minds. But design oscillations will occur at every part of this. We have ways in our project management system of capturing design oscillations quite nicely uh, from a couple of different dimensions. And we look for design oscillations early in the process versus late in the promotion of agility. Let's go to the next slide. 
The other tool to use in this simulation is the power of human foresight. We don't apply it enough in industry, in our daily work. And what is foresight? Well, it's kind of clear you can do some predictions right now. How many of you have been following Chat GPT? Uh, you know what the prediction is. It's already in the Microsoft products, so it's already there. And it's going to be kind of everywhere. So that's okay. That's an easy prediction. We're going to have chat GPT everywhere. So now the question becomes, what are we going to simulate? So if we have the power of foresight and we can think ahead two to three to four years, we have more than enough time to do simulations and progressive ideation and the personal agility process well in advance of the need. We don't do that enough. In fact, the big complaint I get from managers is, well, we just don't have time for that. We're too busy. And my response is, yes, you have them doing it. And that's why you don't have time. That's the age old Lean Six Sigma problem. Next slide. The other piece that we do on this is we try to document everything. In other words, I get from some folks, well, we just don't know what to do here. So we just have a blank box. I said, fill it in. Well, it'd be made up, make it up. Documented fiction is much more powerful than undocumented fiction. When you have documented fi fiction, another eye looks at it and goes, ah, ah, and they res respect, they respond to you, they correct it. If you just have a blank slate, most people do not respond to the blank slate very well. There are some don'ts here. Uh, I've already given you the warning about fancy tools. I think fancy tools are a way, are a distraction. They pull people into less effortful work early. And you also get buried in the artifacts you've just created or very uh, in, indebted to them and you're not willing to change them so easily. Uh, it does invite engagement of trivialities, uh, fonts and colors and things like that, which can come much later in the process. Uh, whatever is well understood, we tend to try to not we set aside, meaning if we know how to do it, we don't have to worry about that. That's understood. Instead, our mind goes right to what don't we know? What problem haven't we solved? What's the most complex thing inside this that we have to tackle? And that's what we try to do as a team, go after those problems. We also don't use methodologies to constrain. Methodologies, especially Lean Six Sigma, should illuminate. In fact, there's an unfortunate association with Lean Six Sigma as elimination of waste, which is really wrong. There may be necessary good waste to add to make Lean Six Sigma beneficial. So Lean Six Sigma is really dedicated to increasing flow. Flow is the movement of goods and materials through the assembly line from the supplier through the line and out to the car or the device being made and delivered to the point of need in the market. That's the flow in the original Toyota production system. I had some time in Kentucky working with Toyota uh, in our university to business uh, uh, site visits we would frequently do and had a long time relationship with several of the folks at Kentucky. So we got to absorb the Toyota production system, which was in their minds, true lean from Toyota's standpoint. So the, the methodology should illuminate and should increase flow first and foremost. So flow for us in, in software work is how to get the software or the information products, I like to say, ready for the user at or before the point of need. And so that's the flow we have to work on. Uh, methodologies also have their own bloat and they often get slavishly followed as if it were a religion uh, and uh, it can lead you astray. I think methodologies also invite a retreat into the familiar and the known. It's like a comfortable chair for many folks and that's a good purpose, but it's, it's really not the main purpose. And avoid meetings. Everybody loves a meeting. You know, a lot of times you don't have to exert cognitive effort in a meeting, right? You can just sit there and, right? And, and then, of course, you got the people with the Zoom who have the image of themselves. It looks like they're attending, but they're really not. My CISO, Mike Korn, had one of those, and he pulled it out on me, and I had no idea. And I thought he was intently looking at me during my conversation. And he wasn't. Next slide. So it told me about my meeting, which was probably a failure. There exists in teams as cognitive diversity, which is an enormously powerful concept. And kind of at a, as a bit of a caricature, I'm going to classify people in two categories, scrubbing bubbles and blue sky thinkers. Now, scrubbing bubbles are the type of people when you bring an idea, they go, oh, that can't be done. Oh, that won't work. Or this is wrong. You didn't think of this. 
One thing about higher education in the academy, we do critique well. We are superb at critiquing. I have no doubt, no matter what idea I present to the academy, in 20 minutes flat, there'll be 300 things wrong with the idea. That skill can be relied on with complete faith. The blue sky thinkers are the people going, oh, but we could do X, Y, Z, and it'd be wonderful, right? Now, how many of you are scrubbing bubble types? And I'm kind of a scrubbing bubble type. Yeah. Now, if you have a room full of scrubbing bubbles and only scrubbing bubbles and you bring an idea forward, what happens? You, 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 if they, they, well, they show up, but then you have this long list of why it won't work and you have no progress whatsoever. So what I tell my teams is scrubbing bubbles, I love you, I need you, but I can't start with you. Your day will shine in shortly in a moment here. I need the blue sky thinkers to create this thing and then they'll bring it to you guys and then you will critique the heck out of it and we'll go back and forth. And the scrubbing bubble goes, yes, I hate those blue sky people anyway. They're so unrealistic. You have to use the cognitive diversity in your team and you gotta get the teammates to understand that. Another phrase I use for the scrubbing bubbles are constraint-based theorists. These are people who develop theories of how things work in their organization based on the features of the organization and all the constraints that are present. These are valuable skills. However, they're not valuable if you're gonna unbuild because you won't get the unbuild you need through that thinking. The blue sky thinkers are more of constraint release. They have no constraints to their thinking. They think anything is possible. And uh, certainly some of our faculty are in that category uh, when it comes to some of the compliance things we have. Oh no, that's not, I don't, I don't need to abide by US law. So the goal here is you gotta, don't lie, that's, um, that's happened. It, ha it happens. Uh, so we gotta involve everybody in the simulation. Next slide. I'll leave you with a list of questions here at the very end. Uh, and the first question is, are we avoid thinking the difficult thought? And I don't mean difficult politically, I mean difficult intellectually. Yeah, there are difficult political thoughts, we think those too, but there's intellectual thoughts that are difficult enough. Is that process, the way we've configured it, is really as lean as we could be? Or is there another completely novel way to think about it that eliminates 90% of the steps? I went through this exercise in my first CIO job where we leaned out an onboarding process of gazillion steps and we got it down to like a third of its size. I looked at it with another person. We said, let's call the head of enrollment management. Let's see if they could make this change. What would, if they could do that? And they did it. And it removed another 80% of the steps. So the process went from like a hundred steps to like five through a challenging of a constraint, a constraint-based theorist, we're assured that it could not be removed. So are we tackling the difficult thought needed? Are we spending too much time describing all the tools we need? Project managers are guilty of this. Well, I need this, I need this, I need a project charter, I need milestones, and blah, 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 blah. no, tell me how you're gonna solve the problem. Well, I don't have that. This is the work to solve the problem, Vince. No, no, tell me how you're gonna solve the problem. Do some personal agility and, and simulation. Are the right minds owning the early ideation? If you want high fidelity uh, solutions, you need small teams of people who can think those really good thoughts and have the freedom to do so. So I often think about that. Uh, how much rework is going on in this process that maybe we could have eliminated? So even when I hand things off to my team, I often say, okay, could I have done a little better on that? Save them a little more time? and vice versa. Now, sometimes we're like, no, that's probably good because we got a dialogue going back and forth, but we do challenge each other to not waste each other's time uh, as we do this work. I've noticed for a lot of what we do in ITS, somewhere around version 20 to 30, it's starting to look good. And by version 20, not of the product, but of the, the, the spreadsheet of the Word document. So we'll often start with an idea day one, put it on a paper and go, that's terrible, right? And somebody says, oh, I want to see the idea. I says, no, you don't want to see it yet. It's pretty terrible. But in a week, it's now up to version 12, and it's gotten a lot better. And then somewhere around 20 to 30, it's like, okay, this is really crisping up, right? And so if we have a power of foresight, we engage in this personal agility without affecting schedule whatsoever. We can get at this very, very early in the process. Are we slaves to our own thoughts? Question I constantly ask. 
Are we just sort of thinking too much inside our own our own house here? We need to get out of the box a little more. Are we reducing fear and increasing desire? Fear does not create great ideas. Fear can create some good ideas, but not great ideas. Desire, passion is what creates great ideas. So I'm very sensitive to the emotional tenor of what we do. And then lately I've been asking a question, it might be for this process Palooza to give an answer. And who is the showrunner? You know, how many, the, the term showrunner, it's like crept into our usage without an announcement, right? Suddenly I'm seeing all these things on showrunners. I'm like, when did that become a thing? Well, the showrunners are the people who have the responsibility. They're kind of like a Uber project manager, but more than that, they're a spiritual owner of the thing in question. What happens in industry and in education is that oftentimes uh, we diffuse that responsibility so that it doesn't really become a common goal. Uh, it sort of becomes partially handled. So when I look at, well, who's in charge? It's like talking to the board ship. That answer is useless, Vince, right? We're all in charge. Sooner or later, you need a showrunner, somebody who's really, or a couple of people who are really taking responsibility for driving uh, the idea uh, forward. So that's a question I've been asking lately. Does our industry and does the software industry and the process improvement industry need the concept that Hollywood has called a showrunner? Don't know the answer. Next slide. So thank you for indulging me in going a little bit over here uh, on the time, but uh, I don't think we've done enough to reify methodologies for personal agility. Uh, the literature and the scientific literature is a little bit empty in that spot. There's some there, but it's not as deep as you'd think. And certainly I, I think if we can do a better job of applying the concepts of Lean Six Sigma and continuous improvement to the space between our ears, we can improve flow, we can engage our teammates better, and we can make a difference in the world. And my last question is, where can this idea fail? So scrubbing bubbles, now's your time to shine. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, hello. I'll keep this very quick. My name is Miguel Rodriguez. I work for Educational Technology Services. I am one of your other MCs for today. Thank you, Vince, uh, for that talk. I very quickly want to say, I don't know if Chris Hergert's in the room, but on our Process Palooza 2023 site, we have a link to an idea wave. So over the course of this event, if you think of processes that you want to share with all your colleagues, make that happen. You can go to that idea wave and share. But um, I have something to pump us up. I'm going to invite Tracy O'Rourke back on stage. I'm going to give you an introduction. If I see Tracy, do I see Tracy? Uh, do I do, do I, everybody do the drum roll? Okay. So uh, it is time for the world premiere. If you are on LinkedIn, you probably know what this is going to be because this kind of took LinkedIn by storm. Tracy did a music video that we're going to uh, make into an audience participation event, something that gets your heart pumping. Oh my God, girlfriend, look at that line. It is so long. It's like shopping during the holidays. I don't understand why they just don't fix it. I only came here for one thing. And now we have to wait a really long time because the line is way out there, okay? I mean, that line, it's just so long. I don't have time to stand around. It's so out there. I mean, gross. Look, it's just so... Why I like lean tools and I cannot lie. My sensei won't deny. Process with a ton of waste and a problem in your face, you get scrum. Wanna do your gamba? See the work is a dilemma. Upset and close, I swearing. I'm close and I can't stop caring. Oh, baby, baby, I wanna get with ya. Be a process fixer. My sensei tried to warn me, but waste makes me so crazy. Oh, see you scratching your chin, you're heading for a tail spin. Lean on me. Trust me, you're not an average worker be. I see you scrambling. The heck with the stressing. We met, you connect, 
you got to run like a tree bus truck and climb around with a shrink can with old school type of thinking and if also start that track, that's going to make everyone yak. So, sensei, sensei, are people trying new tools? Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate that good stuff. Baby got tools. Baby got tools. Oh, it is start? No, I want you to crush waist like ah, uh, double up ah uh, ah, uh. like ah, uh, double up. Uh, uh. That's working. Hello? Oh, you can hear Brings me joy. I want it rim thick and juicy. When find that dirty trouble and find the double part of that stash called bubble. <laughs> To the bully bosses, I want to talk to ya. Don't spit or yell at ya, but I gotta be straight when I say, Wake up and blast this song. Heck to a Kanban. <laughs> All right, that's my, my music video. Can you hear me okay? Oh, it's on, it's on. Okay, it's working. Oh, here we go. Okay, you guys, at the alumni mixer, we did a couple dance moves. Hey, right, this, remember the sprinkler? Not done until we squeeze in some fun. Press the roll. We can do it. Oh, such a crap. The process is with jacked. I was better to the women in Lee's soul sister. Why my rivers fix a lot? Take that way, sister. That fools. We got tools. Okay, guys, ready for the next one? Okay, stop. Woo! Okay, thank you. Obviously, I'm not a rapper. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Green Belt instructor. <laughs> okay, but guess what? We are going to, uh, I'm going to need a volunteer for this next part. Anybody? Anybody want to volunteer? Well, uh, maybe. Okay, Paul, come on up here. All right. Oh. Okay, Paul, here. Here is your microphone. Here's your microphone. Hello. Put on your hat. We'll get your hat on. You got a hat on? Process fixer? Yeah. All right. So, this next section, do you trust me? No. <laughs> okay, we're going to do a little karaoke here. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, do you like karaoke? Uh, like, if I could sing like Bon Jovi or something. Have you ever uh, done Baby Got Back? <laughs> no. Okay. All right, well, here's the lyrics right here. Come oh, and stand in the room. Because okay. oh. like this, this one's not working, I think. Yes, it is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So you, here's the lyrics, Paul. The fishbone diagram. Yeah, this is the first, this is the first section of the song. Oh, okay. yeah. And he's going to try it. He's going to model it for you. And then we're all going to do it. Everybody's going to do it. And then we're doing a 15-second dance party. So you better use those skills oh. you learned last night at the mixer. Okay? This so is not going to be as cool as the Japanese drum group. That was awesome. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so how do you feel about karaoke? It's usually good. This song, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, and, and how long have you been? What do you do here? I'm a project manager for IT services. He's a project manager. Okay, so when it gets down to one, All right. we're going to start the song again. We're going to see how this goes. Ready? Oh, God. Two, one. I like green tools, and I cannot lie. <laughs> 
My sensei won't deny. A poor process with a ton of waste uh, problem in your face. You it's growing. <laughs> all right, all right. That was my best attempt. Yeah. Suburban guy rapping. Okay. Everybody's going to try it now. Everybody's going to do the karaoke. You got to see Paul model it, right? That's good enough, right? So stand up. Everybody stand up. And here are the lyrics. And then we're going to do this. And we're going to be followed with a 15 second dance party. Go ahead and practice your 80s moves. Ready? So that I cannot lie. My sensei won't deny. My process with the time of waste of the problem in your face, you get sprung. That's about all I got. I'm taking this Lego with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, is this still on? Can you hear me? It's not on. The mics are not working. Paul, do you still have that mic? Let me see. Is this one working? This one? Hello? Hello? Okay. Okay. Woo! I, I need more personal agility. Let me take a breath for a minute. That was a lot of work. Okay, uh, I worked on my cardio there. Um, okay, so we have, guess how many people came to Process Palooza today? Anybody know? Well, a 900 people registered total, and there's 760 in person or 670 in person. So that's awesome. And the theme this year is, as you guys know, build, unbuild, and rebuild. And you know, just as Marie said, we're always doing this. We're building, unbuilding, and rebuilding. And we do that in process improvement all the time. But she's absolutely right. Unbuilding is sometimes the hard part. And, you know, we have to be, we have to focus on teams and collaboration and do a really good job with how we do that together. But it's also, as Vince said, in the mind, it's, our, it's a mindset too. Knowing you're going to be building and rebuilding, uh, unbuilding and rebuilding, that's just a part of of what it, of the way we do things and and as Chancellor Nicola had said too, this is what we do all the time at UCSD. Uh, so so that's really the it's it's happening everywhere. It's happening in processes. It's happening in buildings. It's happening between our ears, as everybody says. So so that's really the theme for this year. Okay, so um, so now I think we are going to move into live streaming to see what's going on with the competition. Okay, so uh, I think you guys are going to give me the, you're going to try to get some live streaming going, right? So we'll see how that goes. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about the, this great innovate, this great innovate race. How many people have actually participated in this innovate race before? Hands. Okay, good. They're all over here helping out so they don't have to compete this year. Okay, so if, if you don't know what it is, it's a real UC San Diego process that they're looking to improve and they're, they actually, they volunteer it up to be worked on by a team. So three teams will try to work on this process and come up with a recommendation to the process owner. And then the process owner decides who the winner is. So we've actually got two processes. We've had two processes every year and uh, there's uh, three teams working on process one and three teams working on process two or process A and process B. I can't, I can't remember what they decided to do. Oh, okay. 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 So we're not doing the live streaming. You're gonna have to walk over there. <laughs> okay. Cause we're out of time. Um, okay. So really quickly though, before we let you go, Miguel's going to talk about the raffle. Miguel, where are you? He ran away. I scared him on the last time. Okay, so there's a raffle that's coming up. Uh, so make sure that you participate in that. And then, and then um, Tassim is gonna be talking about the schedule. Did you wanna talk about the schedule really quick, Tassim? 
Here comes Tassine. Tassine's our, our third MC. Welcome, Tassine. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. I'm Tassine Lazzini. I work in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at UCSD. It's a pleasure to be here and a very special welcome to our audience attending virtually on live stream. So thank you for being here. Yes, there you are. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to talk about the schedule a little bit later, but I'd like to first start with giving you uh, a little bit of, of letting you know where to go if you need information, because this process Palooza is big. It's an extravaganza. There's so much going on. You have your schedules, which you obtained when you signed in, but you may have questions. So for questions, please go to our information table in the West Ballroom. That's also known as the Community Pavilion. So please go there if you have questions. I'd also like to point out that throughout the process, our incredible Process Palooza Committee will be volunteering this whole day. And they've been spending a lot of time in probably the months leading up to today. So please give them a big, big round of applause. Okay, you guys, we are right on the tail end. You get to a quick bathroom break, and then you're going to run off to your 10 a.m. breakout sessions, and then 11 a.m., and then back here at 1.30 for the award ceremony. We'll see you soon. Woohoo! Thank you.